and uh, Natural Resource Institute Finland, Luke and Syke um, Environmental uh, Research Institute of, of Finland. Mm. Now, uh, the reason I'm being here uh, is that Katrina Soini, who would uh, ordinarily chair uh, this um, session or would chair this session today, uh, she is indisposed uh, due to, uh, you can guess what, uh, the, the pandemic is, is all around. So I will be uh, chairing this seminar today, and, but we will then go on as we usually go along in this seminar. Today, we will be asking how uh, could the lessons from the past guide us towards the future? Uh, and we have two extremely interesting presentations, uh, both approaching this topic uh, from a histori historical perspective, uh, but from different disciplinary uh, points of view. So first, we will listen to Matti Ohannikainen, a postdoctoral researcher at Helsus, uh, who will be talking to us about fish and perceptions about fish uh, within the confines of environmental history and sustainability, specifically within as an aspect of that. And then we will be listening after that, we will be listening to Juha Honkaniemi, a researcher uh, from, from Luke, who will be talking about the interesting historical path dependencies and kinds of traces from the past showing up uh, in current uh, forest uh, illnesses and diseases and the ways in which they spread. So this will be the program for today and uh, warmly welcome to everybody and I invite now uh, Matti uh, if you could please share your screen and of course if you wish to if you wish to uh, specify further who you are, uh, in addition to what I already told, feel free to do so. The screen is yours and welcome. Thank you, Nina. And thank you so much for asking me to present my paper today. Uh, my name is Matti Hannikainen. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki at the Department of History. I'm a member of Helsus Institute, among other affiliations. Currently, I'm working at the city of Vanda as a project researcher there. But today, my topic is noble stock or rough fish, classifying fish in Finnish society during the 20th century. This is a project uh, that ended in January 22. Uh, it was funded by Mayan Turnestin Foundation. And, uh, in this presentation, I shall analyze how different species of fish have been valued and consumed in Finland during the 20th century. In this research, I recognized and analyzed three discourses that have employed the concept rough fish during the 20th century. First, culinary, that was based on cookbooks and women's magazines, for instance. Second, the recreational, based on sports fishing magazines and uh, literature and thirdly scientific based on textbooks official records like parliamentary reports on fishing and academic and fishing journal articles and it is on this last discourse the scientific we focus on today i will first analyze rough fish as concept in this scientific discourse how it has evolved and affected uh, classification of various species of fish in Finnish society. And I hope that my research will contribute to the ongoing discussion examining human animal relationship in a modern urbanizing society has, that has attracted only little scholarly attention so far. To begin with, the scientific discourse began in the 1880s already, but most likely there had been some initial discussion about improving the catch in the aftermath of the Great Famine. Rough fish, meaning fresh fish, for instance, roskakala in Finnish or skrepfiske po svenska, is a relatively new concept linked to the advent of new scientific thinking for rationalizing fishing and more precisely basic, being based on the human idea mastering the nature. The Senate had appointed the first inspector of for fishing in 1861 already, but yet we do not know much about the early activities. 
However, there were two reasons for rationalizing fishing. First was the need to modernize it. In a similar way, agriculture was being modernized in the aftermath of the Great Famine. The second aimed at making fishing a commercially viable industry, thus transforming the prevailing subsistence fishing into an industry, which argument has remained powerful ever since. The aim was to increase both the annual catch of fish and the income of fisher folk. It was essential, therefore, to classify all species of fish according to their commercial value, which was influenced, if not dictated, by their culinary values such as taste and size. Only few species were ranked commercially valuable species, so CVS. Many more were classified less valuable, and few, most notably blue bream, silver bream, and the sticklebacks, were classified useless, trash which could be, if necessary, exterminated altogether. So the concept of rockfish refers to species with little or no value for human consumption. And it, the scientific discourse in general advocated complete human mastery over nature, stripping all agency away from fish, making them passive human controlled species. And among the first persons to promote the scientific discourse was Oskar Nordquist, who was then the inspector of fishing in the Grand Duchy of Finland, and other members of Suomen Kalastusyhdistys that was established in 1891 to rationalize fishing. And it was in the following decades that the discourse continued spread by publications of scientific writing about fishing. The 1920s 20s, perhaps, witnessed some of the most fiercest writings concerning rough fish and classification of fish in general. These were fueled partially by the growing concern over the sustainability of the most commercially valuable species, like Atlantic salmon. One of the most active writers was the limnologist Heikki Anefeld, who served later as a professor at the University of Helsinki. In June 1923, Janevelt wrote in Turun Sanomat that, I quote, we should wage a ruthless war against aiming to remorselessly exterminate all those fish we cannot use commercially. End of quote. Janevelt ended this article, like many other writings, with the sinister words, I quote again, above all, annihilate trash fish. End of quote. While other writings by other authors in this case supported similar policy, the scientific discourse remained nonetheless confined within the academia, given the difficulties in implementing this kind of proposals. Above all, Finland, most lakes were and are divided between various landowners, and to realize the proposed action to exterminate a species would have required land ownership to concentrate for someone he either rented or totally owned, which did not take place. Nonetheless, the scientific discourse began to disseminate into public discussion via new textbooks, like Suomen Kalat, published by Professor Valle in 1934, that became the standard textbook on fish. So, there was a discourse that continued much longer. And I move on to criticize this concept from a public point of view. Because common people itself, a dubious concept, continued to consume everything caught, even in the 1920s, 30s and later. These photos shown to you now are taken from Suomen Kuvalehti 1924, a magazine on societal issues with high subscription rate within upper ties of society. They seem to promote a common perception of fishing and the aim of the scientific discourse, that, that is, that fishing is commercial industry focusing on the commercial valuable species. As you can see on the right hand side, the river with being full of salmon. However, the reality was something quite different. On the upper left hand corner, there's a picture from River Espo where an old couple is netting roaches which illustrates 
the idea that everything consumed, everything caught will be consumed as food in Finnish society. So there is a difference between the sustainable perspective of scientific discourse, classifying this, and what people could afford for their food, not overlooking any species at all in the 1920s, 30s, and even 50s later on. But to move on, the Second World War and the wartime food rationing revealed how the consumption of fish had began to change during the preceding decades. The demand, and to a certain extent supply too, had limited down to few commercially valuable species. While some species like roach, rough and rudd enjoyed a brief peak in their consumption, given the scarcity of options during the war years, their consumption fell as soon as commercial fishing continued in normal conditions in the late 1940s. After 1945, moreover, Finland began to urbanize and modernize rapidly. In new homes, novelties like electric kitchenware, including stoves, refrigerators and even freezers, proliferated. Simultaneously, fresh fish replaced salted fish, marking one of the greatest changes in Finnish food history. Import of frozen fish, mainly from Norway, grew from less than a million kilos to over 6.8 million kilos between 1958 and 1973, which indicated a change in demand for fish bonelessness fish, as these were served in fillets. These transitions affected the value of numerous native species of fish, most notably Baltic herring, previously consumed as salted, and roach too. More in addition, the construction of new hydroelectric power plants in numerous rivers and the increasing pollution levels depleted the stock of many anadromous species, salmon, lake salmon and trout. These changes prompt the parliament to set up various committees to investigate the state of fishing in Finland in the 1950s and 60s. In 1951, for instance, a committee investigating fishing of Baltic herring during the spring season pointed out the low value of rough fish like roach, rudd, blue bream and silver bream that could be a future food reserve. In 1953, another committee analyzing how to improve freshwater fishing concluded that in order to support the commercially valuable freshwater species like Wendis and whitefish, it was necessary to exterminate all rough fish. These committees hence discussed the extermination of rough fish as a possibility to improve the income of fishermen folk, repeating the idea of the scientific discourse from the 1880s. In contrast, a committee that assessed the condition of fishing in 1967 noted that many valuable species like salmon and trout and lamprey were disappearing given the increase in pollution in Finnish, Finnish waters. In contrast, the number of the less valuable species like roach and blue bream was growing, leading the committee to revise the classification. There were no longer any rough fish officially, only commercially valuable species and less valuable species or less profitable species. The concept of rough fish was thus replaced by a new concept, which marked a change, if not change of paradigm. Instead of aiming to exterminate species altogether, these species that were considered worthless, I mean, the scientific discourse began to ponder a possibility to increase their consumption. Despite, despite the continuous increase of overall catch of fish since the 19 since the early 1950s, due to the modernization of fishing, the crucial point was that fishing as well as consumption fish was becoming more selective. In 1976, another committee noted that only the so-called less valuable species could be fished more intensively without depleting their stock, stocks, despite growing demand for the commercial valuable species. In fact, the problem Problems that had hampered modernization of fishing since the 1880s remained and remain apparently. Selective consumer demand, low organization of fishing based often on a single vote coupled with low investment on processing the catch and poor logistics 
connecting fishing communities to growing urban centers. In this point of rupture, it was the new fish farms that became profitable by farming rainbow trout in particular. Their numbers grew, and by the mid-1980s, there were altogether 453 fish farms in Finland, of which 151 operated sea pools in the Baltic compared, in addition to 302 facilities located inland, by which time the production of rainbow trout had reached 5.4 million kilos per annum. Above all, rainbow trout provided a staple catch being sold in the ready cut fillets at an affordable price compared to the rare and expensive salmon, explaining its popularity and growing consumption. In the following decade, number of recipes for rainbow trout outnumbered those of Baltic herring in many cookbooks, indicating a significant change in demand and consumption of farmed fish over native fish. Paradoxically, when the concept of rough fish disappeared from the scientific and official documents and there were interest in increasing their consumption, a new environmental policy emerged. It aimed at curbing fertilizer, fertilizer runoffs into water systems. Since the early 1970s, if not earlier, there have been numerous mass removals of rough fish from numerous lakes, pond streams, and even the Baltic, areas that have suffered from oxygen deficiency in most cases due to overuse of fertilizers. And these rough fish have always belonged to the family of roach, blue bream, silver bream, to mention the most numerable ones. This policy has targeted these less valuable species, thus echoing the idea of exterminating rough fish but in a different concept based on environmentalism this time. So, to conclude, the relationship between fish, Finnish people, has been dominated by human perspective, allowing almost total human exploitation of fish during the past century. By analyzing what has been devalued as rough fish, as well as noble stock, will provide us with new perspective in what Finnish people have eaten and what they have valued as their preferable food, and how a modernizing society and the process itself has affected something as mundane as cooking as food culture. The scientific discourse on fish was influential in promoting categorization of fish species into commercially valuable, less valuable and trash. The gradual commercialization of fishing, coupled with profound societal changes, turned previously unselective local subsistence fishing into selective industrial fishing, driven by more and more affluent consumerism over the decades of the 20th century. After all, as an unsubsidized trade, fishing is one of the few where the demand defines supply. Replacing cute fish by fresh fish during the 1950s at latest was one of the greatest changes in Finnish food culture that affected the value and consumption of many species, most notably Baltic herring. Since the 1950s, imports of frozen fish and after the 1960s, farmed fish like the rainbow trout have further affected demand for native species and their consumption has but decreased. To conclude, finally, as a recent study suggests that by 1930, well, excuse me, by 2030s, many maritime as well as freshwater fish stocks will be depleted beyond commercial use. There is, however, potential in Finnish trash fish, as it was previously called, as a future food reserve, initially su suggested in the 1960s. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fascinating presentation, Matti. Uh, we will open we will open the general discussion after Juha has has held his speech. But just a brief reflection for you to ponder. 
upon uh, while uh, while going over to that. Uh, in your research, you have described how the scientific discourses grew out out of the famine uh, at the end of the 19th century, and how this kind of places an arc uh, of trying to look at all kinds of uh, edible fish. And now when we have a kind of projected famine uh, in the future, uh, how would you perceive of this projected famine kind of changing or would they change uh, the, class the scientific classifications? Of course they change, I mean, this cultural and, and, and subsistence and different sorts of other, but how about the scientific ones? So this is something that I would really much like to hear more about then. Uh, after uh, we have heard Juha's presentation. So thank you for this. And uh, now we move over to Juha. Where do we have Juha? Um, mm, 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 let me see now. Uh, Juha, we have you over there. Yes, so uh, welcome Juha, uh, who will be talking to us then about uh, uh, epidemiological feminine of conifer root rot, if I understood you correctly. The screen is yours. Thank you. Nina, uh, let me share my presentation. And switch of screens and there we go. Oh. Let's go to the beginning. And again. I hope you see the presentation now. Um, so my name is Juha Honkaniemi, a research scientist working at Luke, mainly focusing on, on the interaction between forest management and natural disturbances in, in, uh, in forests. And today I'm going to talk to you about how management legacies uh, sh are shaping the, the, for, uh, the root rot risks in, in conifers forests in Finland. And when we are talking about heter, uh, root rot, we're mainly talking about an agent called heter, a group of fungi called heteropacidian, which are causing namely root rot in trees, but also decaying stems, uh, decreasing the timber quality, as well as the, they're causing also uh, uh, growth losses and mortality of trees. Uh, in Finland, the, the annual losses have been estimated to be over 50 million euros. So it's, it's not something, something small affecting our forests. Um, it's also a, a widespread, widespread problem and one of the most uh, common forest pathogens uh, throughout the whole northern hemisphere. We have uh, five different species in the, uh, um, of this group of heteropacidian root rot in the northern hemisphere, two in North America and three, three native ones in, uh, in Europe and Asia. Um, besides it being, uh, besides having a wide distribution over the whole northern hemisphere, the epidemiology is also quite fascinating. So uh, heteropacidian spreads to new and healthy uh, forests via uh, basidia spores. And these spores, they have a special requirement. So they need, uh, they need fresh wood tissue for germination. So for, for to, to grow and establish. And in natural conditions that's offered uh, usually through different wounds and injuries, which result from uh, winds after wind storms or such. But forest management and human actions in forests have actually uh, created a great niche for this pathogen. So during, when we're logging forests, we're actually creating the ultimate medium for these spores. So the fresh stump surfaces that we do, they are the perfect, perfect medium for these, uh, for these spores and thus creating a route for or a pathway for the pathogen into our forests. So this is how the primary infections happen. And once the spores have established on these on the stumps, they can cause uh, they can grow as mycelia into the into the root system and then spread via root contacts to living tree generations. And thus this is called the secondary infections. 
in the forest. And this can continue over three generations. So you can imagine this goes on over centuries. Um, in the Nudix, the spore production uh, occurs mainly during the growing season, roughly from April to November. So that's the time when the basidiocarps are producing the, uh, these spores. And when the, the spore infection risk is highest. However, majority of the spores do land really close to their origin. So one, it's they, they can spread roughly up to two, uh, up to 100 to 200 meters. Um, so this means that it's a really slow uh, pathogen to spread. I mean, a few hundred meters, and then uh, needs or requires a specific medium for for establishment. And what, if it established, it still needs, or it, it, it's still really slow in spread uh, through the root system. What this means, it's it's a slow spreading uh, agent, but a really persistent one. So it can stay there, as I said, uh, over centuries. Um, we were interested uh, about the root rot distribution in Finland and especially what are the underlying drivers for that distribution? So we compiled a database on national forest inventory uh, data uh, from time 1996 to 2017. So we had the observations where uh, heteropasidia is present at the moment. And we can see that southern Finland and the coastal areas are sort of hotspots. Uh, for the disease. It's, it's, a, it's a nice fact already, but we were interested about, as I mentioned, the underlying, uh, underlying drivers. There's been uh, several studies in the past about focusing on the how current state of the forest could explain the distribution, and we included those or, or, or variables of, the, of that uh, also in our analysis. So basal, for example, forest basal area, a percentage of the host species, spruce or, or pine, uh, also metrics for landscape uh, level species composition, as well as some soil characteristics. But uh, due to the facts that I already mentioned, the speciality, specialities in the, in the epidemiology, we also wanted to include some proxies for past forest management and land use and how those would affect the distribution. So we had uh, 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 measures for forest past forest management intensity or other other land use types such as cattle grazing and slash and burn cultivation. So the first that we included in our model was the sawmills and their locations in Finland in 1907. So sawmills dominated Finnish forest industry uh, in the early 1900s and before that. And we knew the location and production value for each sawmill in 1907. So we basically uh, calculated the distance from a measured uh, national forest inventory plot to a nearest sawmill in 1907. Uh, and uh, the hypothesis was that the closer the plot is to, uh, to an old sawmill, the higher the probability that the forest has been uh, managed at some at some point. <clears throat> the second one that from the past forest management uh, proxies were timber rafting, which was the main transportation method until 1960s and 70s in Finland. So we assumed that um, stands nearby streams would have had higher potential for being cut, especially during the uh, spore production season. And that these uh, stands nearby streams were also, uh, they had a potentially higher trafficking due to the rafting, which could have led to injuries and, and wounds. And then we also had this forest grazing, which was common uh, in last uh, last century. And this cattle grazing often led to wounds and injuries on trees, thus, the hypothesis was that it could uh, increase the root rot risk. 
Um, the slash and burn cultivation was also a common practice in Finland until early 1900s. And that uh, affects then the species or has affected the species composition in Finland. So where where we had more slash and cultivate slash and burn cultivation, like here on the figure in eastern Finland, the current species composition is more birch dominated. So there's less uh, less of the host species for for root rot, and also it changes the, some of the soil characteristics. And the hypothesis here was that it could lower the root rot risk potential. So we compiled the NFI data with all these historical uh, spatial data sets and ran a, a boosted regression tree analysis, sort of machine learning uh, algorithm for our quite large, large data set. And what it resulted was really interesting. So the distance to sawmill in 1907 was the best variable to explain uh, the root rot presence in Finland, or the current root rot presence in Finland. The second most important was the distance to waterway, both proxies for past forest management. And if we take a closer look at the whole list, we can see that the list is here, the eight most important ones are dominated by uh, variables related to past management and land use legacies, to climate and to landscape structure in general, and the current state, uh, current uh, state and stand qualities are actually not that important, except for the uh, percentage of Norway's spruce in stand, which means that whether there is actually the host present or not at the moment. Um, so what we can learn, so this is the past and how past has affected the present moment, what we can learn from this for the future. Um, first of all, uh, the changing climate will increase the risk. We saw that temperature sum was one of the best explanatory variables in the model. And the more, uh, the, the, as the temperatures increase, the, uh, the uh, spore production days are increasing all over the Finland. So we're having more days where uh, heteroposidion is producing these spores and thus the, the risk for infections is increasing. In addition, the, uh, the increasing temperatures are also increasing the vegetative growth. So the growth that uh, uh, that's happening underground in the root systems. So both uh, temperature, uh, increasing temperatures increase the root rot risk. And at the same time, uh, we're already harvesting almost half of our annual harvest in Finland during the spore production season. And this will increase in the future as we're having higher, uh, longer spore production seasons, and assuming that we have to have to uh, harvest forests uh, throughout the year. So um, the current management decisions and how we're harvesting our forests can have huge impacts on the future forests. So to conclude my presentation. Um, it's important to remember that heteroposidion is one of the most important forest pathogens in Finnish forests, but and also in, in the, throughout the whole northern northern hemisphere. And in Finland, the losses are at the moment over 50 million euros per year. Um, on Norway's spruce, uh, heteroposidion root rot is, root rot is also a, a, a big stressor, predisposing. Um, predisposing the trees to other disturbance agents, for example, wind and bark beetle. So it uh, decreases the root system strength and thus the trees are more vulnerable in, in storm event during the storm events. And, and then they are also vulnerable for bark beetle attacks. And as our results showed, the past management and land use, land use were far more important 
uh, variables explaining the, the uh, root root distribution and the current state of the forest. And this just highlights that our actions and the management decisions that we're making today, they can have last le long lasting legacy effects for the future forests. Thank you. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. Uh, it's wonderful to see how quantitative modeling uh, practices can be used to make management legacies uh, visible. So I think this is again a wonderful example of how you can combine uh, different aspects. I have one question for you as well, uh, not to necessarily to be answered immediately, but to ponder. Uh, you have shown us now how the past is, is, is present for us still uh, after a hundred years, and you have pointed to risks uh, with that, with actions that we do now. Uh, in your opinion, and from the point of view of root rot, what would be the manage the shifts or changes in management practices that could or should be done uh, from um, to avoid or at least mitigate or somehow adapt to uh, those perceivable changes that we already can see that those are signals of things going in this direction. So that would be my one question for you to think about. But now I open up the floor uh, for general discussion. Uh, you may come back uh, whenever you like to my questions. But now the floor is, or screen, is the audience's. Any immediate reactions? We could perhaps have also Matti opening his camera. And everybody who speaks, of course. If there's the deep uh, teams and Zoom silence, then I would invite you to reflect um, uh, verbally on the two questions that I posed to you. We could start with Matti. Well, thank you, Nina. Hope you have my voice now. Yes. Well, the future famine is uh, where well, we never know when it's going to hit at you, whether it's going to be famine, but I. In a way, with this research, I hope that people would start to appreciate more the resources we have already at hand. And uh, perhaps naively to say that starting to disregard the standard size and the elements we consider tasty with food. Not only with, with fish, but also with weeds. So algae that could be produced for food stuff. Because it's uh, interesting to look, to, for instance, the textbooks on fish starting from 1890s onwards, that they're, the first ones do not have clear classification on fish, basically saying you can eat everything there is. But gradually it, it creeps in, if I may say this way, the idea of scientific classification of species according to the commercial value based on their taste and also their size. Often there's a text up to the 1990s even, this is very tasty one, apart when it's some herring and sprat, but it's too small for commercial usage, which is a nice symptom of the whole idea in this discourse. And I dare say I have the idea of writing an article in environmental history titled Size Matters, but that's a different story now. But, uh, I think it's also the idea that we have been so, if I may say, spoiled with the perception of having salmon and whitefish all around, that we have been able to look beyond these fish that we have had. And it's clear from the evidence, not only cookbooks, but also from the textbooks, that there's constant discussion going on that how can we increase consumption of native species in Finland instead of importing fish from abroad, which is also a kind of ethical, but it's also ecological question, but because importing means that it's from somewhere and can we be nowadays so that it's sustainable. And it's more pressing nowadays, this question too. And it's one of the questions that we, we really haven't Oh, the problems are still the same as they were in the 1880s. The logistics, the underinvestment in fishing, and also the 
public demand for fish. It hasn't changed, so there might be much to do with education. But now, that was a kind of a not so short, but hopefully provocative reply. <laughs> Thank you for this and looking forward for uh, new articles on the matter. Uh, now I see that there's a hand up, but I can't see uh, whose I hand. Will, uh, me, Susanna, will shout from here that... Okay, we, please shout. Yeah. Usually at this phase we stop recording so that people can more freely talk. Okay. And I see the recording is going on, so uh, Tia, if you have that at hand, we could switch that off to 